John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, Wise sound skippers, though skies be fine, reef their sails when they see the sign of the blazing wreck of the Palatine. There was no ship, the Palatine, however. Instead, there was a ship of Palatine immigrants called the Princess Augusta, lost time and only remembered as a glimmer on the sea. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Our friend is looking for a ghost story. Would you happen to have the Princess Augusta haunts Block Island? Here we are. Enjoy! From this time, it is said, the Palatine Light appeared and there are many who firmly believe it to be a ship of fire to which their fantastic and distempered imaginations figure masts, ropes, and flowing sails. Dr. Aaron C. Wiley wrote to a fellow physician, 1811. Despite his somewhat dismissive tone when speaking of people thinking it was a ship, he admitted in the same letter that he had seen the light himself. This curious, irradiative, rises from the ocean near the northern point of the island. Its appearance is nothing different from a blaze of fire. Whether it actually touches the water, or merely hovers over it, is uncertain. By calling the light the Palatine Light, even if he is reluctant to declare it a flaming ship, Dr. Wiley was tying it to a ship in the history of Block Island. The Princess Augusta, certainly could have seemed as though she was a cursed ship when she arrived off of the coast of Rhode Island shortly after Christmas, 1738. The immigrants flooded from the Palatine region of Germany into Rotterdam, far more than what any of the merchants engaged in the Palatine trade, as it was known, could have possibly anticipated. News of opportunities in the American colonies, as well as letters sent home from people who had already settled there, encouraged thousands of people from both Germany and Switzerland to swarm to Rotterdam, seeking passage on the immigrant ships that gathered there every spring. The Palatine trade was a well-structured business by 1738, with a few firms that specialized in it based in Rotterdam, including the Hope Firm. The British would only allow British ships to bring immigrants to their colonies, crewed by primarily British crews. The firms that participated in the Palatine trade were therefore also of British origin, making it their business to provide ships that the colonies would accept, full of brand new settlers, so desperately sought in many places along the Atlantic coast. Some colonies and cities were even willing to pay a bounty to captains who brought them new citizens. After the ships had deposited their passengers at their destination, they were able to pick up cargoes, usually from the Bahamas or West Indies, and return to Europe, another profitable voyage complete. As the wave of Palatine immigrants arrived in Rotterdam in 1738, a new order was in place to greet them, however. Rotterdam was tired of the waves of immigrants entering their city, and they had made an order to prohibit their entry into the city. Instead, the firms in charge of transporting them were told to have their passengers stay in a temporary holding area outside of the city until they could be boarded onto a ship. By May 13th, the court of Kralingen, where the holding area was located, petitioned the states of Holland asking for a speedy remedy whether either the Palatine passengers were sent back to where they had come from or embarked on ships. It was early in the season, and there were already 200 people in the temporary camp, including the elderly and children, many of them poor. It noted that an epidemic was already starting to take hold in the camp, and it was just beginning. The firms that generally brought Palatine immigrants to the colonies 
had a usual fleet of ships at their disposal, but it was clear that this was not going to be enough for the flood of people who wanted passage in 1738. They sent to England for additional ships that they could charter. Among the ships that responded to the call for additional ships was the Princess Augusta, which had sailed for the Hope Company with Palatine immigrants once before. Carpenters quickly went to work building the bunks in the ship that would allow for her to once more carry the large number of people they expected to put on her. The Princess Augusta had been built in England in 1720 and had made many lengthy ocean voyages by the time that she was chartered by the Hope Company for the Palatine Voyage of 1738. Perhaps out of consideration of her advanced age, the Hope Company added to their contract with the owners of the Princess Augusta that if the ship were to wreck and the passengers were not delivered to their destination, they would not pay for the voyage. The age of the ship did not prevent the Hope Company from packing as many people as possible onto the Princess Augusta, however. It was later recorded that once the Palatines were assigned to ships, they were packed so tightly that overall, at least one-third more were loaded than what is considered normal. For the 200-ton Princess Augusta, this meant that she was now carrying around 400 people, in addition to her 16 crew members, and her 20-year-old captain, Captain Long. She also carried all of the chests that the passengers were bringing with them to start their new life, and all of the food and water that would be needed to keep them all alive for what was generally a six-month voyage. It was noted, as the passengers boarded the ship, that some of them were already sick. Rotterdam was eager to see the Palatines gone, and it was already late June late in the season, for a Palatine ship to begin her voyage. As the Palatine ships began to come into port in Philadelphia after their long voyages from Europe, it became increasingly clear that this season was not like past ones. There was usually death on such ships. The voyage was a difficult one. But this was much worse than anyone could have expected. Dysentery was rampant on all of the ships, and the death counts went up on each ship that reached the harbor as the season progressed. One ship had 80 people die, another had 90, then another had 115 people die, and another had 140. Whatever disease had taken hold in camp outside of Rotterdam as they had waited for the ships to come had come with them. Even worse, the ships that came into port also spoke of a difficult crossing with strong storms battering their ships. For those who survived the voyage, their troubles were not over. Many people traveled in a family unit, and if someone died in the voyage, their family was still responsible for paying their passage. This debt led many people into lengthy contracts of indentured servitude as soon as they landed. To enforce this, Captains would often hold the belongings of the passengers on board of the ship until they had received full payment. The German community in Pennsylvania began to write expressing concern back to Germany about the stories that they were hearing and the hardships they were witnessing. On November 28th, a group of Germans in Philadelphia wrote back to Germany saying that they were very concerned about the fates of two ships that had been at sea at that point for 24 weeks. They did not expect many survivors. One of the ships that they were referring to was the Princess Augusta. There was good reason to be concerned, though the Princess Augusta had seemed as though her voyage was going to be a normal one at first. Soon it became apparent that the disease that had already claimed so many lives was in their midst. This was later blamed on the ship's drinking water. Instead of being stored in unused casks, as was practice on long voyages, the water had been stored in used wine casks. Water on a ship was never pleasant to drink after some months at sea, but the water on the Princess Augusta became sickening. In total, approximately 240 passengers would die of the disease on the Princess Augusta, as well as half of the 16-man crew. Among the dead was also Captain Long, his first mate Andrew Brook, was now in command of the vessel. In likelihood, the passengers were now forced to help with running of the ship, 
though no record remains. There is very little record of the events that followed. It is known that the Princess Augusta first saw the shores of America in early December, but it was not Pennsylvania as the passengers had been promised, but rather the coast of the Carolinas. The Princess Augusta had made an unscheduled stop in Charleston. It has been put forward that Captain Brooke was desperate to make the voyage a profitable one for the company that owned the ship, and with the delay in their arrival, they could not expect any cargo further to the south to be left for them. Instead, he took on a cargo of ironwood in Charleston before turning his ship back to her original destination. A far greater mystery than him taking on cargo is why he failed to take on water or more of the wine and brandy that the passengers were also supposed to be allowed per their contract with the Hope Company. As the ship started the last leg of her journey, the water ran out, and Captain Brooke allegedly began to sell the passengers half rations of wine and brandy, rather than just giving it to them. This, too, might have been an attempt to recoup some of the ship's financial losses on the voyage. He would definitely prove to be a shrewd businessman, if not a particularly humane one. As they reached the coast of Rhode Island, yet another one of the fierce storms that had dogged the ship's travels blew in, this time a blizzard. The bitter cold caused frostbite and made it so some of the little remaining crew were so debilitated by the cold that they could no longer assist with the handling of the ship. The lack of provisions also weakened both the passengers and the crew. The ship was being blown further and further off course, but there was nothing that anyone could do about it other than try their best to keep her afloat. At one point, they tried flying distress flags off the coast of Rhode Island, but when there was no response, they decided to try again for Philadelphia. On the 27th of December, after being tossed on the stormy seas for days, the Princess Augusta grounded on a sandbar a mile and a half off the northern end of Block Island. From here, there are two stories, one of which goes hand in hand with the tail of the fiery ship that could be seen from the shores of Block Island. The first account is the story that the Block Island residents told themselves. After the ship had grounded, Captain Brooke went to the locals for help. They said that they had eagerly stepped up, finding a ship full of passengers who were in diseased and dying condition. As they would later tell it, they had to beg Captain Brooke to lower the anchor, something he did not think was needed since the ship was so well grounded. The local men knew the waters of the area better, though, and thought that the tide could easily refloat the ship, which would be her doom, since she was badly damaged by the grounding. Once Captain Brooke finally complied and lowered the anchor, the locals got to work unloading the passengers and carrying them to safety. They asked to also bring the passengers' belongings to shore, but Captain Brooke refused. In all likelihood, he was counting on the industry practice of not allowing the passengers to unload their belongings until they had paid their full fare. It might have been standard practice, but considering the situation, to the locals it seemed heartless, especially since they could not help but note that Captain Brooke was occupying his time while they rescued the passengers to unload the belongings of himself and the sailors, as well as any goods that might be of value on the ship. As the surviving passengers were moved to a temporary housing and the cottages usually used by the residents during the growing season, the local residents observed that Captain Brooke seemed to be mainly occupied with stripping the ship of all its tackle. The next day, the Block Island residents said that they had gone to Captain Brooke, who was still stripping the ship, and asked him again for the passengers' belongings. He again refused. They also asked for bread to feed the Palatines, since they had not eaten for two days. This, too, was refused. Captain Brooke seemed determined to deny the passengers 
and the local residents of anything that might at some point be sold to defray the expenses of the voyage, even in the face of human suffering. The Palatines were soon taken in by the various households on the island, who did their best to care for them, though some had already died on the beach of exposure, and more yet would die on the island of either the disease that had traveled with them or the hardships they had endured. In total, the lowest estimate of those who died on Block Island was 30. These were buried in a mass grave by the Block Island residents, in a grave simply marked Palatines. For reasons unknown, Captain Brook raised the ship's anchor and proved the predictions of the locals correct. The Princess Augusta was in a poor condition, but floating in the sound on the morning of the 29th. Some of the Block Island residents decided to take matters into their own hands and rode out to the ship to grab 20 of the chests from the ship. These items were auctioned off as salvage, with the first part going to pay for the rescue and the remainder being split between all of the surviving Palatines. An estimated 90 people of the original 400 to have embarked in Rotterdam. That night, a storm blew in, and in the space of three hours, the Princess Augusta was smashed to pieces. As chests and wood came to shore, it was gathered. Usually, such items would be subject to salvage rights, with a third going to the person who recovered them. But considering the circumstances, most people on Block Island felt that this was in bad taste. That was not to say that no one tried to claim anything from the wreck, but the governor soon sent someone to try to ensure that the Palatine passengers' property and rights were protected. They initially put the local constable in charge of the rescued goods, but on discovering that he was one of the largest pilferer of goods, this custody was given elsewhere until they could be distributed to the survivors. Eventually, the Palatines would move on to their original destination of Philadelphia, with the exception of two women who decided to make their home on Block Island. Soon, another story began to circulate, though. After all people on the mainland knew, or thought they knew at least, how things worked in the small, isolated island settlements. The Block Island residents had surely taken everything they could from the Palatines, robbing from them and extorting their money. In fact, how did anyone know that the Block Island residents were not wreckers and pirates who had lured the ship onto the shore in the first place? As this story grew, the Block Island residents wrote an account to protest their good character, but it went unheeded. Over the years, the story grew. At the same time, the name of the ship was lost to the sands of time. It went to being a Palatine ship, to being the ship, the Palatine. It would not be until 1939 that researchers would come across the original papers describing her wreck, and put a name once again to the Palatine light. Outside of Block Island, the story of the Palatine was well cemented though many of the details of the ship were changed along the way. She became a Dutch ship, lured onto the rocks by wreckers in 1752, who had killed everyone and then set fire to the ship to hide their crime. As they had watched her burn, a woman rushed from the hold where she had been hiding from the wreckers, but it was too late. They watched as she burned with the ship. After that, the Palatine light had begun to appear. In one version, it first appeared the year after they had burned the ship. In some stories, it would appear around Christmas and the New Year, when the ship had sank. In others, she appeared right before a storm. The accounts of her were all the same, though. An eerie light that looked as though it was a burning ship. One man said that the lights were so strong that they flickered on his bedroom walls in his house sometimes. In 1867, John Greenleaf Whittier penned the poem The Palatine, which speaks not only of deadly wreckers, but also of a ghostly ship. Now low and dim, now clear and higher, leaps up the terrible ghost of fire, 
then, slowly sinking, the flames expire. For him, as well as for many other people who told the story, the ghostly ship was a haunting punishment to the islanders for what they had done. When asked about the sinking of the ship, at least one Block Island resident protested around the same time as Whittier was putting pen to paper. He had heard of the ship that had wrecked, but she certainly had not been burned. They would have never wasted wood that would be so useful. Indeed, some of the ironwood that had been the cargo of the Princess Augusta was still in use around the island into the 1800s, many in the form of mortars that were used to make flour. Though the people of Block Island dismissed the idea that they had wrecked the vessel, or that she had ever burned, it did not change the eerie specter that sometimes appeared on the water. They also believed it to be the Palatine ship, but they put her spectral remains down to an entirely different reason. One of the women who chose to remain on the island was known to the residents as Dutch Cattern, and she was a fortune teller and a witch. There were some that claimed that she had cursed the ship that had left her on their shore, caused so much misery, and claimed so many lives, and that was why it continued to appear before them. No matter the reason, accounts of seeing a burning ship off of the shore of Block Island continued into the 20th century, with one captain in the 1800s even writing of going to aid her, not being aware of the local legend. He wrote that she sank beneath the waves in front of them, and there was no wreckage on the sea. In every account, she is the same. A pyramid of fire when large, with three separate pillars of fire coming from a base like a ship, and a small glimmer on the water when small. She will go between the two sizes for several minutes before sinking once more under the waves. For the people who made their treacherous voyage on board the Princess Augusta, the light is an enduring legacy of their hardships, and the terrible loss of life that plagued the Palatine immigrants of the year 1738. For more information, please see The Palatine Wreck by Jill Thornelli for a well-researched account of the tragic Princess Augusta's final voyage, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.